75 years ago today marks the amphibious landing on the island of Iwo Jima. Within the span of five weeks, over 6,000 Americans died. Your word tells us, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. As we assemble around the Iwo Jima monument, may we remember that the many freedoms we enjoy and cherish today are due to the faithful service of Iwo Jima veterans. We thank you for their honor, their courage, commitment, and sacrifice to this nation. May their faithful service inspire us as a country to work for the greater good for one another, our country, and the nations around the world. We ask your blessings on this sacred time as we remember the sacrifices of these veterans. In your holy name I pray, amen. Details and hut post forward. Rifleman, port, arm. One step forward. One step forward. Right, face, forward, north. Yeah. What are we going to do when we grow up, huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay, at this time, Vinnie Thomas, would you like to come up, please? Oh, 
get out of the way for some. I was thinking, what am I going to speak about today, a couple of days ago, but anyway, I uh, didn't have anything planned, but something happened. I, uh, February 23, 1945, and we're going to have a celebration. And I thought, maybe I'll speak about it. How do I go about it? But anyway, uh, I'm going I'm not going to speak about evil or anything like that. I'm going to tell you, uh, I've been working for the, for the people today, an eyewitness account of February 23rd, 19, 1945, that, that fell on, on a Friday, 75 years ago, when the raising started. February 23rd, at that time, was on a Friday morning. Today, it falls on a Sunday, but 75 years ago, it was on a Friday. I became acquainted with an eyewitness of the uh, raging of the fly. There's a lot of controversy today, but I'm going to tell you the true story. The fellow that the eyewitness, uh, the fellow he was in charge of the race squad for so went up the mountain. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. He wrote me a letter. His name is David uh, Severance. And he retired as a colonel from the United States Marine Corps. But then he will he gets a captain. He wrote me a letter on August the 5th, 2011. And I'm going to read to the letter he wrote to me, and then I will read to you the letter that he wrote to the Marine Corps, eyewitnessing of the way of five raving on evil. Tonight, or rather this afternoon, you will be hearing, or you will be hearing this, the eyewitness of raising the flag on evil chief. Now, here's the letter he wrote to me. And when I get through with the letter, I'm going to give it to the child, to the chaplain, to his record, because this is authentic. It's notarized. Uh, it's notarized. And, uh, So, dear Vince, it is unfortunate that some of our members do not know the true story of the Iwo Jima flights on Suribachi. But then, in 67 years, the Marine Corps has not accepted what really happened. In talking to Dr. Nimeyer, Director of History of the Marine Corps, he flat out admits the Marine Corps provides flag inquiries with information from three sources. All three are fraught with errors. One would think that with Rosenthal's photo, now being a Marine Corps icon, someone up there would get off their butt to make sure history to reuse has the correct story. I cannot convince them, and I believe it is because they refuse to admit that at one time in the past, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel deliberately defied the wishes of a Secretary of the Navy. Uh, give me the answers to this in the next letter. And enclosing a copy of an enclosure from a 2004 letter to the Commandant Marine Corps, in which Lieutenant Greeley was adjutant of the 2nd Battalion, 28 Marines on Evo. And I composed a true story of the flag event. 
I did not receive a written response to my letter. I did query Colonel John Ripley, then Director of Historic of History Division, as to any action on my letter. He said the Commandant stated, I believe, that the matter must be resolved by the veterans. That's rather stupid. There's as much as two veterans were submitting the document and two were probably the only two officers who are survivors of the second retired 28th Marine staff. Should you publish the story I have enclosed, it might curtail the stories you received who state the second flag was raised because the first flag was too small. Perhaps it is a result of the Marine Corps' slow response to flag inquiries. I have a file drawer with over 60 stories of men from all services who erroneously claim to have somehow been involved in raising flags, providing flags, or finding flag poles on EWO. That's from Dave Severance, a fellow I was at with who wrote this letter to me. Now, I have the eyewitness report of the fellows who have not so far to and they're going to be rather interested in what I've got to say. Now, the details in the following story have, for the most part, originated with Second Lieutenant Gritty Wells, United States Marine Corps, who was the adjutant on the 2nd Battalion, 28 Marines, during the preparation for the assault on EWO and during the battle. Additional information is based on Associated Press photographer Joe Rosenthal's interview and conversation. As the battalion adjutant once assured, Lieutenant Wells became the quasi aide to the battalion commander and was with him or near him whenever Lieutenant Colonel Chandler Johnson was the command post. Now, I'm going to read you this eyewitness of the flag waving. This is before the Marines landed on the island. Sometime near the latter part of November 1944, members of the staff and company commanders of the 2nd Battalion, 28 Marines, met in the battalion war room to be briefed on their upcoming combat mission. In the center of the room was a sand table, modeled of the island of Iwo Jima scaled on the basis of about one foot, one, e one foot equal to one mile on the island. There was outwardly displayed apprehension, now known as shock and awe, when it was revealed that the 28 Marines were tasked with capturing the southern portion of the island, including a 545 foot high inactive volcano, Mount Suribachi. There were some rather bravo and vital remarks made, one of which the first unit to the top should receive some type of reward. One such, such prize mentioned was champagne. I recall thinking there would not be a requirement for a large quantity of the beverage for the few who might make it to the top. Lieutenant really well, the adjutant, then remarked that the Marine Corps staff manual required a unit adjutant to carry a flag on any combat operation. Interesting to me about that. Really suggested that the first one to reach the summit of the volcano could raise the flag. All seemed to agree, and there was no more talk of rewards. The next time I heard the flag mentioned was on the 23rd of February, 1945, after the 28th Marines had captured the base of the volcano. Now remember, this is eyewitness by Dave D. Severance. At about 9 p. Uh, excuse me, at about 9 a.m. on February 23rd, 1945, a four-man patrol from Company F, 28th Marines, led by Sergeant Sherman Watson and including Corporal George Mercer, 
private tourist class Ted White, and private tourist class Louis Charlotte, climb the north eastern slope of Mount Servaci. They observed no enemy activity during their climb. Not the summit, nor their descent. As the four men patrols descended, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson ordered me, that's the one that started, to provide him with a platoon to be led by, by my executive officer, First Lieutenant H. George Schwab. So he's telling me that he sent up a four man patrol to see if the coast was clear. And they went up, they went up, and they came down. Nothing. The patrol was comprised of about 25 men from my third platoon, approximately 12 men from the machine gun platoon, and seven from the 60 mm mortar section. When the patrol arrived at the battalion, command post, Colonel Johnson gave Lieutenant Schreiber a small flag brought ashore from the USS Missoula by By Lieutenant Rupert, and told him that if the patrol was able to reach the summit, he was to raise the flag. The patrol encountered no resistance, and at, at, at 10 20 a.m., tied the small flag to a piece of pipe located by Corporal Leader and Private First Class Leo Rosa. Later on, uh, Leo Rosa was killed. The six Marines who raised the flag were First Lieutenant George Schreier, Platoon Sergeant Ernest Thomas, Sergeant Henry Hansen, Corporal Charles Lindbergh, Private First Class Louis Schaller, Company F, and Private James Michaels. The Leatherneck Magazine photographer, Sergeant Lou Laurie, was on hand to photograph the action. Unfortunately, he was out of film and had to photograph the scene after the flag had been raised. In doing so, he rearranged the position of several members, thus taking a photo that was, in effect, posed. The first one was posed. Almost immediately after the flag was raised, three or four enemy soldiers rushed out of their caves, firing rifles and throwing grenades. One was a Japanese officer waving a broken sword. The enemy soldiers were quickly cut down by the patrol members. Photographer Lowry, while dodging a grenade explosion, jumped down the slope of the volcano, sliding, sliding forth 15 to 20 feet. His camera was broken, but his, but his exposed film was not hurt. Word had been passed throughout the command that a patrol was climbing Mount Sorvacha and would raise a flag. As the flag was raised, the troops on the island cheered, and the ships offshore blew their horns and sirens. The event gave a boost to the morale of the troops in the midst of a grim battle, not since the pension. Soon after the first flag was raised, Colonel Johnson heard that the Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, who together with Lieutenant General H.M. Smith, I just landed on the beach. Had expressed a desire to have the small flag as a memento on his visit to Iwo. Interesting. Colonel Johnson responded by explaining, "Hell no. Hell no. We can have. A, we can't have our flag. We put it up there, and we're going to keep it." He did send Lieutenant. Second Lieutenant Albert Tuttle to the beach area to find another flag. He planned to use it to replace the regular flag, thus he would be, thus he would be able to save the first flag as a battalion souvenir. Lieutenant Tuttle told me in later years that as he was leaving the command post, the colonel called out to him, see if you can get a larger flag. Lieutenant Tuttle obtained a large swimming flag from an LST-779. I received an order to provide a detailed constraint telephone wires to Sir Roger 
Petrillo, and Vincent, Michael Strank, Corporal Howard Block, Private First Class Howard Hayes, and Private First Class Franklin Susley to the Battalion Command Post. Company E runner, Private First Class Rudy Janay, has been sent by Lieutenant Wells to secure fresh radio batteries for Shriver's patrol. And Gagnon joins Sergeant Strength's detail for the ascent. As they're about to depart, Colonel Johnson landed, handed, excuse me, Gagnon the ceremonial flag. And then told Sergeant Strength to have Lieutenant Shriver replace a small flag and send it down to him. Oh, it's nice. First hand, Paul, Charles of the Union, Patrol, the left there. And this is the interest. This is it. This story. Climbing the volcano at about the same time as Shrank detail, as Strike's detail, and at some distance behind were Associated Press photographer Joe Rosenthal and two Marine photographers, Sergeant William Janals and Clyde First Class Camper. You notice that anything he reports, he mentions names, so you know it's accurate. Dave Sellers. About halfway up the volcano, the photographers met Lou Lawley, who was coming down to look for another camera. Lawley told the group that he had already photographed the flag being raised, but there was a terrific view to be seen if it continued to the top. The three photographers talked among themselves and decided to continue the, the climb. As they reached the summit, they saw a group of Marines attaching a large flag to a second pipe, located by Private First Class Ira Hayes and Private First Class Frank Susley. They were told that the small flag was to be replaced and kept by the souvenir. Rosenthal and General Grinoff backed away to a, to a position about 30 feet from the flight post sack and prepared to confirm the large flag being raised. Tampa moved into another position where he could capture the movement of both flags. The North Star filming with his movie camera using color film as the Marines prepared to raise the second flag. Rosenthal was caught by surprise when the large flag started up it was quickly to snap one exposure, which was to become famous and win a Pulitzer Prize. The time was shortly after 12 o'clock. No. No official record at the time had part of this uh, situation. Let the public know the real story. Uh, it's the second flag. I want to see how they get it out. Oh, the second flag was was by the pipe was found by Frank Susley, Susley and Ira Hayes. Well, I did get a little story about the reading the flag and I hope that the well he can go back excuse me, don't say that fake news, you can talk all you want. But this I think involves politics. I knew the Secretary of Navy somehow, this is my opinion, I think not my own. I think that uh, Secretary of State has something to do with during that time and that the uh, Marines not really recognize uh, the way he's trying. But at, at this time, uh, I'd like to give to uh, Todd, or give it to Jose, to give him a copy, a copy. of the letter from uh, David, uh, from Dave Savage.
Thank you, Vinny. I'm going to talk just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to keep it very short because I'm going to talk about more history of this park later. Now, everybody, I wasn't here 25 years ago when they dedicated this park. From what I saw, the pictures, there was thousands of people here. And of course, we had many more Timujima survivors. Uh, we did have two more World War II vets come in while Vinny was talking. Uh, Peter Slangel, he just graduated from Thompson Street University, actually, he's 97 years old. World War II veteran. And, uh, and uh, Nicholas DeRay, uh, he was in the Navy, Iwo Jima, 99. 99. Thank you for your service. You know, I just want to point out, we tried to do this event so the survivors of World War II vets would be very proud of us to help them. And we added a lot of little details here that probably people won't recognize unless I point them out. Uh, for instance, when the Marine Corps came up to post the colors, they used an American flag that the survivors used for many, many years. It's a 48-star flag. That's the one they carried in parades and they used for the banquets. The, uh, the small podium that we're using is on a World War II field table. We just thought it'd be more appropriate to add as much into World War II here today as we could. And when we ring the bell later, uh, we'll unveil it, but we found the actual bell they used 25 years ago here. So we're going to use that today. And of course, we're going to unveil a big flag later. It's a 48 star flag. It's 25 feet by 11 feet. It came from uh, Stan Dombrowski, Iwo Jima survivor, Corman on Iwo Jima. Um, as far as I can figure, they probably use it in parades. That is a 48 star, and it is over 75 years old. So this whole day's event, we're trying to keep right to that theme of World War II try to pay tribute to these survivors. The monument, a lot of people know about it, a lot of people don't. The monument was built by Iwo Jima survivors. They raised all the money to build this. They went out, and they got donations, they sold stuff in front of stores. They probably raised money for close to 10 years. They raised somewhere around $300,000 to build this park. And when we say they built it, Everybody's invited later to go to the launch at the firehouse. We have actual photos of them working the property. They did the bulldozers, the backhoes, they cut the trees, they cleared all the brush, they designed this. Uh, in the base of the monument has sand from Iwo Jima. This monument's not a duplicate to the one in D.C., which is a marine memorial. This one's in Iwo Jima. It pays tribute to all the branches who fought and died on Iwo Jima. When they found the sculpture house down in New York to uh, build this memorial, they brought their uniforms, their rifles, their helmets down there so the guy could go from the photo and actual how uh, real uniforms from that period of time laid on their, their model so it's more authentic, we think, more detail. And the rocks around the feet of the men, uh, we did a lot of research and we have documentation that these might be the only rocks ever allowed to leave the island. And they came right from the site of the first and second flag raisins on Mount Suribachi. So, you know, this is really kind of a special monument. It's the only one ever built by survivors anywhere. And uh, it just runs on volunteers and donations. But, you know, I'm proud to be here with these guys today and help them out. Um, I'm going to ask the, uh, the family of Frank Sarosky, I think his two nephews are here to come up and say a few words. They're going to tell you what Frank's sacrifice was for here and what he did. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming as well, veterans and all our guests today. And then I'm going to run show you guys. Uh, I'm Frank Sarosky's nephew, Frank's uh, the survivors. Frank uh, was a uh, staff sergeant in the U.S. Army. He was a photographer attached to the 5th Marine Division. And uh, in the last few years of his life, he 
dedicated lots of time and effort to a, a monument built uh, even in the rocks that came from uh, Suravachi. Uh, Frank's a very kind, generous man. He donated a lot of that money to a lot of organizations. Just the name of few is Kiwanis Club in Newington, BFW, American Legion. Uh, he was a constable for the city. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lord took his life April 8, 1894, right here on the site. And uh, so we were about to see the monument. Uh, and also, at this time, I can thank the survivors of the Yellow Roy. Donated the uh, park bench. The name of my uncle is still right underneath the tree over here for anybody viewing. Also, my uncle donated a uh, uh, replica statue of the monument that sits up at the state capitol uh, in the hallway between the capitol and the House of Representatives. And it's about a 1 8 to 1 quarter scale. And that's all. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, Vinnie Thomas said he'd like to come back up and talk about Frank. He knew Frank very well. I was going to... Well, anyway, I was with Frank Zaraski at our Memorial Park site when he was taken from us. His final words to us were about giving. At 7.30 a.m. that morning, he asked about the wood chips we would have after removing the brush from the monument site. That if it was not already called for, he knew a local club that needed the wood chips. Then he mentioned that another local club was going to make a contribution to our memorial fund. Finally he talked about Newington Memorial Day Parade and our, and our participation in it. It was mentioned that our parade marches were going, marches were ordering 30 new ties, which were red, so that we would all be in uniform and look sharp at the Newington Day Parade. His reply was, send me the bill. A few minutes later, his life ended with a heart attack. Uh, and he had a heart attack from up his built as part. After the battle for Iwo Jima, Ever Limit South, uncommon value, was a common virtue. Virtue. For Frank Zoraski, we can add. Uncommon charity and love for his fellow man was his shining virtue. The family of Frank Zaraski is here today. I would like to have them sing a hat like them for you and say a few words. And of course, the program changed a little, so I decided I would speak up that I'm one of the original uh, building of this park. Thank you. Right now we have uh, one of our guest speakers, Renee Gagnon, Jr. Good late morning or early afternoon, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. I think I've seen quite a few of you yesterday, and we had a wonderful celebration. Once again, I'd like to thank Gary and Marianne for putting this event together. And if you come around and take a look at everybody that's here, this was no easy task. Because you've got people from a whole bunch of different walks of life that have shown up here today. I am impressed to very much see a lot of them. Survivors from evil. But I know my dad ran across at some point on that island. 
It was a difficult island, difficult battle. The planning said you go in there for three, four days, we got it wiped out. Tell that to the ships that were bombing the hell out of the island. Never happened. Then they landed. And these people that are sitting here up front today can probably give you a good description other than for memories that might have plagued them for most of their, most of their adult lives. I'm happy to see you here. My only hope is that somewhere down the road we can double or triple this audience to include hopefully a few of the still survivors but their, their immediate family. But I'd like to see more youth, more young people that can bring this history to life, that can keep it embellished in our hearts so that what we've gone through, you know, what my father and these other people struggled to give us, our freedom, the right to say what we want, where we live, and how we're going to live it. History could have turned itself around in that battle, but we stood on the right side for everyone. So let's take that memory and share it with everyone we know, family, friends, relatives, and let's not be afraid to stand up and say, God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. All right, at this time, we have uh, another guest speaker, Rear Admiral Todd. He is the chaplain of the Marine Corps, uh, Deputy Chief of the Navy Chaplains. it could have stormed, we were going to be here, because this is the only place where we have a monument to chaplains who served on Iwo Jima. You own that distinction, and since it's been 75 years since the battle, we definitely wanted to be here. I just want to say thank you to all the organizers, uh, particularly we're thankful to Gary Roy and Marion, just the uh, hard work you guys did. It's it really truly is a testimony to the kind of what's best about America. Not necessarily having military connections personally, but as citizens creating this support for our veterans, this attitude in society that we support our warriors. When we send them off to war, we bring them back and care for them. So thanks, Gary. We just really appreciate it. Uh, just also thank you to the Iwo Jima survivors. Vinny, thank you for your words this morning. We'll definitely take that back to the Commandant, make sure he gets a copy of it. And um, we appreciate the, just the, the legacy of the Marines and sailors who fought on Iwo, one of the bloodiest battles in the Pacific. This very day, 75 years ago, some of the bravest Americans of all time fought the Battle of Iwo Jima. Many of those heroic men were lost in that fight. They gave their lives to defend the freedom of our nation. We never want to forget those sacrifices. We never want to forget that character, that inspiring character that Chester Nimitz talked about among the men who fought on Iwo Jima. Uncommon valor was a common virtue. And what an honor it is to be with those people 
embodied that virtue here today. Please, let's take a moment and give them a hand. Thank you for the survivors. We thank every veteran who fought in that battle and fought through all the battles in the Pacific, but all of the conflicts down through the ages. We thank you not only for the sacrifice, but we thank you for the example. The example of putting service to country first. That, that example to faithfulness, to the, to the idea of honor, that honor actually means something, that it has impact and it motivates people. And you aren't afraid to sacrifice, to sacrifice for a just cause. This is about justice and righteousness and about a group of warriors who are willing to stand up and do the right thing. As I said before, I'm especially honored to be here, to be part of this story about chaplains. I'm just, I'm just very thrilled to see a monument to those chaplains who often quietly did their, their duty. The placard on this memorial states, chaplains restored our spirit and faith in the darkest hours of combat and consoled and prayed with the dying as they made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. What a legacy those chaplains have set for my community, for the chaplains who currently serve, Navy chaplains who serve the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Set us the example of being there for warriors as they traverse the valley of the shadow of death. And in that valley to provide hope and comfort and to honor their losses in combat. On the memorial, there's a photo of Chaplain Gage Hoadley, whose son wrote a book about his service and one that I enjoyed reading very much. It talked about his father having to do the burials, 1,800 burials for Marines in three weeks. Gage Hoadley was not a smoker when he started his duty, but he took up smoking to cover the stench of the bodies as he would bury them. And yet he quietly did his duty to provide the honor due his flock of Marines and sailors in his care, often doing it while Japanese snipers fired upon them and yet quietly. The losses of life incurred on this island were regrettably vital to the war effort at that time. I don't know if you know the history, but capturing the island of Iwo Jima was important for the American forces. We needed the ability to control the island's runways. It allowed us to prevent Japanese fighter pilots from intercepting American long-range bombers, and it gave our fighter pilots the ability to escort our long-range bombers on their bombing missions over mainland Japan. Yet knowing that the island was of such importance, the Japanese were determined to keep control of it. There were about 22,000 Japanese under the command of Lieutenant General Kuri Gayashi. His men built strong defensive positions throughout the island, many of which were highly fortified and underground. Thus, as American planes bombed the island for two months, the damage was minimal. And so once the Americans came ashore, the beaches were littered with carnage. American advanced only several hundred meters per day. They did so, and they made progress, and eventually they accomplished their mission and took the island. 
out of the 22 out of the 22,000 Japanese soldiers a little over a thousand survived on the American side some estimates suggest the battle resulted in over 6,800 deaths certainly one of the bloodiest battles and your community has skin in that game blood in that fight Carmen Abate if I'm saying that right a marine artilleryman from New Britain who served with the 4th Marine Division landed on Iwo Jima on the third day we found a quote that he shared his experience we went in in a landing craft and jumped off we were sitting ducks there was a mortar attack and no place to hide I jumped in a hole that was my first 10 minutes on Iwo I eventually got out unscathed one out of three Marines got hit the first day. I think of Carmine's story and imagine facing his challenges or any of the brave Marines sailors on that island. I'm thankful though the Navy chaplains and Navy corpsmen were by their side each day providing pastoral encouragement, and of course, that needed medical care. Chaplain Gittleson, who served on the island, was a rabbi with the 5th Marine Division and was the first Jewish chaplain to serve in the Marine Corps. His sermon is considered one of the most famous sermons delivered during World War II. Rabbi Gittleson said, some of us have buried our closest friends here. We saw these men killed before our very eyes. Any one of us might have died in their places. Indeed, some of us are alive and breathing at this very moment only because men who lie here beneath us had the courage and strength give their lives for ours. To speak in memory of such men as these is not easy. Of them too can be said with utter truth. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Of them we can never forget what they did. In celebrating the valor of these Marines and sailors and Coast Guardsmen on Iwo Jima, one may wonder, what about today? Do we still have such Marines and sailors as their chaplain? I can say yes, we do. That same character of honor, courage, and commitment that was shown on Iwo Jima as epitome by their, your sacrifice. It infused into the lifeblood of the Navy and the Marine Corps an ethos that is still alive today. The Marines and sailors who serve today do their best to uphold your legacy. They remember you. Let me say almost every day. And the same heart, the same character, the same valor that you showed on Iwo Jima, they strive to do that today. In places like Afghanistan, in Iraq, and wherever their nation calls them to serve. Around Thanksgiving of this year, I was down on Paris Island. Some of you may remember this place. Fondly, I'm sure, right? There's an exercise where the Marines are out in the field learning their craft. 
sweating, working together, often without sleep and working hard. But at, but at the end of the exercise, they march into the main part of Paris Island underneath a banner that says, we make Marines. They march to the drill field. And it's there in formation that they finally, finally receive what they have sought their whole time on Paris Island. They receive their eagle, globe, and anchor. And, but more important than that, they receive the honor from their drill instructor of the title United States Marine. Right on. It's at that point when we refer to them now as a Marine. Something that they will never be able, to, no one will ever be able to take it away from them. But after they receive their EGA, one of the senior drill instructors calls them in into a school circle and they gather around a statue of the flag raising on Iwo Jima. And their senior drill instructor recounts what you did on Iwo Jima. And he infuses into their hearts the same valor that you showed. You may wonder I do not. Our Marines and sailors carry with them the same character, the same heart that you showed on the Virginia. But it is good that we're gathered here today, that we may never forget, that your example can serve as our motivation, that we too will have the character to be with those who need us in our community, in our nation, and around the world. The Marine Corps has two missions, to fight this nation's battles and to make Marines. We make Marines to make the world a better place. God bless the Navy, God bless the United States Marine Corps, and God bless the United States. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you very much, very, very much. And uh, at this time, we're going to ask uh, Vinny Thomas, Mira Matan to come back up and we're going to place the wreath. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have Tom Callahan, Callahan come up. He's going to sing Stars and Stripes over Iwo Jima, uh, the song that he wrote. <laughs> Two corrections. My name is not Callahan, but Callanan. We got the H out of there. Thank you. And I did not write the song. Bob Wills from the Texas Playboys wrote the song in 1945. I make it a thing. 
Um, while he's going to be singing, we're, this is the time that the, uh, the 48 star flag is going to be unveiled over there and held. That is a flag that came from Stan Dombrowski, uh, the corpsman on Iwo Jima. That's a 48 star flag. It's 25 by 11 feet. As far as we can tell, it's over 75 years old, and I believe the survivors probably used to use it in parades many years ago. When the Yanks raised the stars over Iwo Jima Island, through the blood and tears they won through. Bless the heart of each Yankee there on Iwo Jima Island, resting neath a blanket of blue. High on the hill, Sirbachi flies, old glory, and she always will. When the Yanks raised the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima Island, they were tears in their eyes, though they smiled. When the Yanks raised the stripes on, when the Yanks raised the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima Island, every heart could sing once again. And the sight of old glory over Iwo Jima Island swelled the hearts of all fighting men. Long way it wave over the hilltop as a symbol of heroes who died. When the Yanks raise the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima Island, each American heart filled with pride. When the Yanks raise the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima Island, through the blood and tears they won through. Thus the heart of each Yankee there on Iwo Jima Island. Resting neath a blanket of blue. High on the hill, Surabachi flies, oh glory, and she always will. When the Yanks raised the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima Isle, there were tears in their hearts, though they smiled. There were tears in their hearts, though they smiled. This time, uh, like to call up Stan Dombrowski's sons. They're going to call the names to keep the tradition going of their dad, who's passed away. Gary and Richard. Okay, uh, right now I'm going to announce the, uh, the four individuals we're going to have to, call, to ring the bell today. And uh, we're going to break them up. There's 100 men, so each one's going to ring the bell for 25 of them. First one is Bill Berger. Uh, he's the son of uh, Iwo Jima survivor who was killed on the island. Bill was only three years old when his father died. Uh, he came here today from uh, North Carolina to be part of the ceremony. He's going to read it for the first 25. Then we're going to have Wayne Butler. Um, he's the son of um, Iwo Jima survivor. He's, he'll call it for the second. Uh, Renee Gagnon will call it for the third group. And Mark Loretti, who's the son of an Iwo Jima survivor, will call it for the last 25. Now, before I read the names, I said earlier how this bell was used 25 years ago. Uh, we found it 
in a box that came in to us by an Iwo Jima survivor uh, with a lot of photographs. And the more we looked through the photographs, the more we realized that this was the bell used 25 years ago here. And we don't know where it went from there. It hasn't been used in a long time. So what we did was uh, we cleaned it up, we painted it, we mounted it on a different base. But we just thought it'd be really, really a great thing to use the same one they used 25 years ago. And just to remind everybody that when they dedicated this memorial 25 years ago, they had it all wrapped up and they opened it up and they let everybody see it for the first time. Well, everybody's seen this for the last 25 years, so we couldn't do that. So this whole ceremony today is a rededication ceremony. So uh, uh, I'm going to uncover the bell and then I'll have uh, Bill come up and Richard can read the things. I want to thank Gary and Marianne for allowing my brother and I the opportunity uh, to carry on my dad's, the chore that uh, my dad cherished uh, and did for many, many years. Benny R. Amarone. Robert C. Armstrong. Roger W. Arsenault. Richard Barella, Louis G. Benpo, Henry J. Blasky, Fred W. Borger, Walter E. Brandenberger, James M. Bredis. Walter J. Brosaskowski, John N. Budway, William F. Caldwell, Edwin Allen Carlson, Francis D. Carlson, Henry S. Chapman, Paul J. Cushman, Albert J. Del Vecchio, Edward R. Bennett, James E. Dermati, Edward J. DeSaltis, Frank DeWolf. Odell Doyan, James Duffy, Oliver B. Ellsworth, Jr., Irving W. Estabrook, Jr., Ernest D. Evelyn. Edward Azapchuk. William E. Fallon. Frank T. Fisco. James, I'm sorry, John S. Gardner. Joseph L. Gerhardt. Robert A. Deer, Frederick D. Gilbert, Ludwig A. Halas, George F. Highland, 
Edward J. Johnson. Robert E. Frosky. Joseph W. Lindsay. Walter B. Liss. Lauren F. Lane. Enris Ladaraka Jr. Alexander Lego. George E. Lord. Richard P. Lynch. Horton H. Little. Donald E. Malley. William A. Malazuski. Joseph Manzone. Joseph A. Martell. Edward R. Mataba. Raymond McAdoo, John R. McLew, Henry Milkowski, Robert R. Moore, Don B. Moreland, John A. Moscow, Vincenzo Marone, Charles L. Nagel, Joseph J. Noe. Stephen R. O'Donovan. Roger W. Olmsted. Frank W. Palumbo. Donald L. Pennington. David Penuth. Stuart L. Phillips. August. Porco, Steve Rishik, Joseph C. Reardon, Eugene E. Roberts, Armand Jane Robidoux, Charles B. Rossi, George Roth, Jr., Robert A. Rotuno, Frank Senek, Victor J. Sko, Charles P. Smith, Walter Sokol, Aldo Soricelli, Frank Souza, Jr., Ed F. Sparkowski, Walter Stankovich, William R. Soltenberg, Henry F. Suleski, Edward M. Tiro, Raymond D. Thompson, Marvin D. Tinker, Henry A. Tyler Jr., Richard H. Vongigli, Edward H. Voorhees Jr., Carl N. Watch it. William J. White. Herbert A. Wildman, Jr. Richard J. Wilkinson, Jr. David P. Winsborg. John E. Winsler. 
Harold C. Wooster, John J. Yangpuko, James Yerna, Thomas A. Young, John B. Zvach. Thank you very much. At this time, squadron leader, fire the ceremonial service, please. At this time, I guess we can retire the big 48 star flag too. And we're going to have a moment of silence for our Iwo Jima survivors who aren't with us, the 6,821 that didn't come back, and all of our world sacrifice for a greater cause. Grant us the opportunity to help our neighbor, to support justice, to stand up for liberty, and to do what we can to make this world better, to live according to the ethos of Semper Fa. And finally, for those who still stand the watch for our nation, who are even now deployed, underway, or in harm's way, grant your protection over them. Surround them with your angels that, having done their duty, they may return to faithful loved ones waiting for them at home. Fill them with your wisdom and insight that, whether in war or peace, our warriors may serve with honor. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us May the Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to have Judy come back up and sing God Bless America. Some closing remarks and then we're going to retire the colors. Bye. 
Thank you. Thank you for your service. Can you maybe see it? Thank you, Judy. You know, there's, there's always one person we always mention whenever we do a ceremony here, and that was George Gentile. And many of you must remember him. George Gentile was the Kiwi Jima survivor who started the survivors organization here in Connecticut. And thanks to his leadership and the hard work of these survivors, this monument was built. So we gotta thank George for, and George passed away in 2003, but we always gotta mention him. He's a big part of this park, he always will be. <clears throat> the other couple of short things I wanna talk about is, while they're building this park, while they're excavating the property, they found a big boulder on the property. And the first guy who found it says, look at this, we called all the guys over. This rock was in the shape of the island of Iwo Jima. So they took this rock and they put it down there at the walkway, so please take a look at it today when you leave. That rock was found here, it wasn't carved in that shape. Also, we talked about Frank Swarovski earlier. The bench that the survivors had engraved for Frank is on the other side of the monument. Please take a look at that bench and see what a wonderful saying it is. And I think they mentioned that Frank died here for the property in 1994. He'd never seen this completed. We know Frank's with us today. I have to say, we have a beautiful day here. And I think it's because of our Iwo Jima survivors we lost. The 6,821 has given us the opportunity to gather. They've given us their stamp of approval by making it such a beautiful day to be here. Uh, we do have brochures for today's program. They covered yesterday's and today's, and they're up here in the box if anybody would like one. And uh, after the retire the colors, the service is over, but everybody's welcome to go back to the fire station number one in uh, Newington, Connecticut on Main Street. We have lunch provided. We have a huge uh, display of World War II Iwo Jima memorabilia. And a lot of that stuff that we're printing on display today came from our Iwo Jima survivors. They took it off the island river. So we want to keep their legacy going. And this time, I guess, um, we can uh, retire the colors. DJ on right face. Kerry Grant. One step forward. Right face. Forward march. the ceremony for today, but I want to mention one more thing. The monuments behind me here are the small ones, chaplains and the Coleman. Uh, these were paid for by one of our original survivors. He paid for this out of his pocket. After the park was dedicated, he says, we need something here for the chaplains and the Coleman's. So he paid for these, I think it was around $10,000 to get it done. I was really privileged privileged. The chaplain's one was Gage Holdman, who was an Iwo Jima survivor. I knew Gage very well. I 
I learned a lot from him listening to his stories. And the Corman was <clears throat> Stan Dombrowski. I was very pleased to have the time I had with these guys and learned so much about the Battle of Iwo Jima and what the chaplains and the Corman's went through. I want to thank everybody for coming today on behalf of the Iwo Jima survivors. And it's a beautiful day. So I guess uh, really rededication ceremony, put everything together. It really fits the perfect anniversary for the monument 25 years, for the battle 75 years. Thank you. Thank all of our veterans. Thank all of our World War II vets. Thank you very much and come on back to the firehouse.